All right, deliberations over. Deliberations over. Um, so we're now going into the um, Q and A, and um, we'll hear your views. Um, and um, I'm going to invite questions from the floor, which um, our uh, speakers will, will will respond to. And um, we have, there are mics there as as usual. But as usual, I'm going to ask you. To, to, to keep the questions short and precise and just get to the point. We don't need a big introduction or anything like that. We want to deal with as many questions as possible. And uh, Sharon tells me we're going to go until 11.15. 11.15. Very good. Now, table eight. First. Table eight. Good morning. I'm the facilitator for table eight and a question from the citizens at table eight. What does semi-fixed-term parliament mean, and where and how does it operate? Well, I think I'll interrupt there, because that, <laughs> that, I'm that, not sure. that is going to come in session three and session four. Okay. Where, where, where did you find that expression? In it's in the questions that we were asked to ask, the oh. fourth question. Oh, gosh. Yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah. We were ahead of ourselves. Okay. Um, I, th I think we, we, we can deal with that when um, we've heard the next, okay. uh, and in particular what the position is in the United Kingdom. Yes. Uh, table six. Uh, thank you, George. Um, a citizen at this table has um, a question for Dr. Owen O'Malley, and the question is, in relation to the 1994 scenario with Albert Reynolds, how was the decision reached to remain in government without a general election uh, being called? Uh, there's also a second question at this table that a member would like to ask. Yeah, very good. Uh, that's a historical point, yeah. yeah. All right, so in, in 1994, in the case that I was talking about earlier, uh, the government collapsed. Uh, the in effect, the president refused the uh, dissolution of the Dáil, and a new government between. So the government had been Fine Gael and Labour, and or sorry, Fianna Fáil and Labour. Yeah. The, it collapsed, uh, and a new government between Fine Gael, Labour, and Democratic Left was formed. How it happened was that, in, in a way, it was partly down to some by-elections that had taken place in previous years. So it was kind of a small kind of quirk of of, of the electoral. His uh, electoral ar arithmetic, it meant that that government had not been possible uh, when the election had taken place in 1982. But because Democratic Left, I think, had won a couple of seats, it, in a, it was able to happen. Labour was aware of this, Fine Gael was aware of this, and Democratic Left were aware of this. And so they more or less kind of said to each other, we can, let's, let's try to do this. And they pretty quickly negotiated a program for government and governed quite successfully then. So it was the numbers, the numbers. It was just the Throughout the, the duration, election. the numbers had gone against. Yeah, uh, there had there been two by-elections that yeah. enabled that government yeah. to form when it wasn't a possibility in yeah. 1992. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it was a numbers issue. Is yeah. This isn't would just like to um, make a comment on that. Yeah. No, sorry, uh, Liam is my name at table six. I'm a citizen here. Um, no, the question really I wanted to ask was, on that occasion in 94, did the Taoiseach of the day formally request the president to dissolve the Dáil? And no. did the president say no? No, uh, he didn't uh, formally, he requested. It was known that, it, you know, in kind of political circles, it was known that he was thinking about asking for an election. Uh, and then the president also through political kind of back channels, and well, it wasn't even back channels. It was it was in the papers. It was also known that Mary Robinson. It was made known that Mary Robinson would probably refuse that request. So no request happened and no refusal happened, but I think in effect you could say that those thing, two things did probably happen. Okay, thank you. Yes, I table. Yeah. Um, Con McNamara, I'm a citizen at um, table six. In your presentations, you covered very clearly the uh, current constitution, the role and the power of the president, and also the role and the power of the Taoiseach, which can be hugely influential in the timing and the calling of an election. I was surprised that you didn't make any reference to other influences which we are seeing today on a global scale, 
and that is the power of social media because we have just seen in Brexit and we have just seen in the US general election, so it wasn't that relevant as to the power of when it was actually called, but it was the other influences that now are having huge impact. And is this diminishing in some way the power of the leaders of the Prime Minister, or in our case the Taoiseach, of actually calling that there are now other factors that are going to be hugely influential in persuading an electorate as to what they're going to do? Um, well, I'm not, I'm not sure I'd agree with you uh, in that, okay, social media, it's, it's different and it's, and it's new, but there were always, it was always the case that other factors that the press or TV, the, me, the television media, uh, broadcast media would have an impact, our civil society would have an impact on campaigns. Uh, so, I mean, I think we can see throughout history and in some of the examples that I gave earlier that the Taoiseach's power to predict when the government, his, his or her party is, is going to do well, is, was always, uh, was never as, as strong as we, as we might think. And it, it's, it's never a fully predictable power to call an election, in that you don't know what's going to happen in the middle of a campaign. Maybe social media has changed the nature of that somewhat, but I don't think it's fundamentally changed it. It was always uh, a bit unpredictable. I would agree with... Owen, would, yes, would you like... Oh, yes, oh, yes, pardon yes. me, sorry. Um, I, I would agree with uh, Owen, and um, I think, of course, there are always factors other than the, the law and the Constitution influencing the actual timing of, of the election. The, the law only sets a parameters or limits uh, on that uh, issue. Uh, following on what Owen said, you, I suppose you might also add that um, if there is a tendency away from... Um, say, um, single-party government, for example, or a tendency towards a more um, convoluted a parliamentary arithmetic involving uh, more difficult uh, challenges in forming a majority, well, that, uh, that may also change the dynamic of, um, of uh, the Taoiseach's power in the sense that uh, the, the relative predictability or certainty of a government being able to last a full five years uh, may well be gone in many cases. And that's another... That's another factor that is, well, it's not a novel factor, but it's more typical uh, where you don't have a, a very stable majority in the Doyle. Thank you. Yes. It's table 11, yes. Yeah. Uh, I'm the facilitator at table 11, and the citizens at this table have two questions. Um, the first question is to follow up to a previous table. In making the decision, does the president solely make the decision, or do they seek, or must they seek the advice from other staff or the Council of State beforehand. And the other question is, in the panel's view, what's the problem to start with? What is the? Problem to start with in terms of the discussion that's being had today. Yeah. Yes. You can go first. Yeah. Uh, just in terms of the President's power, uh, President can, can refuse dissolution on, on his or her own. They don't, uh, so one of the tables earlier on asked, to, did he or she need to consult with the Council of State? Uh, no. No. Uh, so the power is is just solely with with the president. Uh, yeah. Do you want to add to that? Yeah. And Owen referred to Article 13. Yes. Yeah. It refer yeah. refers to absolute discretion for the president. Um, you know, there won't necessarily be a, a, a public airing of the reasons. It might be, you know, it, it, it won't be deliberated upon or necessarily disclosed. But we don't really know because it's not a common feature of uh, political life. Uh, the other point, what, what's the problem to begin with? Well, it, insofar as there is a problem, we assume that uh, it's felt in some quarters that the influence and clout given to the Taoiseach by a relatively unbridled power to advise dissolution uh, has a negative effect on the balance of power in the political system. Without saying myself that that is a problem, I assume that's the, the premise. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, yes, you're, you're giving uh, Taoiseach some more power that might be considered to be a power over the parliament and so it might in the balance between say the the government and the doll this power the power to call an election might might increase the power of the government vis-a-vis uh, -vis the doll but um whether it that is always the case i mean i think in my presentation i tried to get across that you know that power is really highly contingent and i mean in the current doll you'd probably say non-existent 
And just before we go on, did you bring the Bible today? <laughs> because it, it, it's, it's useful. I've brought it anyway. And I'm just, just, just to really clarify things, I'm going to refer you to Article 13, 2, 1, which says that the all Aaron shall be summoned and dissolved by the President on the advice of the Taoiseach. So the, the, it's the Taoiseach who sets the ball rolling. But um, Article um, 2, 2, at uh, 13.2.2 states, the President may, in his absolute discretion, refuse to dissolve the All Aaron on the advice of, uh, of a Taoiseach who has ceased to retain the support of a majority in the All Aaron. And then, as uh, Owen in his paper uh, points out, um, that power of the President is subject to um, Article 13.8. And I won't read the whole article, it's a, a long article. The President shall not be answerable. Either to, to either houses of the Oireachtas or to any court for the exercise and performance of the powers and functions of his office or any act done and so forth. So um, the, 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 there is no oversight of the president in the ex exercise of his powers unless it, if there are situations in which he has to consult with the Council of State, for instance, an Article 26 reference to the Supreme Court. But um, the, 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 the really, the, the bear in mind um, that the power of the president isn't circumscribed in any way. This particular power. Very good. Table five. Yeah. Table, four. table five, rather. The facilitator at table five. The citizens of this table feel it would be helpful if they had a definition of uh, what exactly a fixed term parliament is, and they have a number of questions in that regard also. Um, firstly, in the current situation, the loss of a vote by government can lead to a general election. What would the consequence of a vote, in a, um, of a vote loss in a fixed-term parliament be? Um, would a fixed-term parliament allow for easier implementation of unpopular legislation, for example, water charges? And what would have happened in the 80s if we had a fixed-term parliament then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think they're, they're good questions. Um, just in terms of a definition of a fixed term parliament, well, I, I suppose it's a parliament whose term is fixed. Um, sorry. Uh, it, it, it is one where I suppose that power is, is taken away, but it can, it can be operationalized in, in lots of different ways. So in some places you could see that there's absolutely no way around calling an early election. In other places there is a sort of uh, a, a way to get out of, of that absolute uh, absolute fixed term. And I think most places, Petra will probably refer to it later on, uh, most places tend to have some sort of way around uh, 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 to, to escape if, if you have a situation such as, uh, say, in the 1980s, uh, you might have had a situation, with a fixed term parliament, you might have had a situation where there was no obvious government, uh, say a government has collapsed, uh, there's no alternative government, yet are you meant to, to then force the government to stay in place without a majority, uh, not terribly popular, no real agenda, and then it is, it, it's just kind of, it, it's forced to continue governing without any popular mandate for up until when the next scheduled election takes place, so it can cause can cause uh, serious problems. Um, just in for something like water charges, I'm not quite sure what the impact would have been on something like water charges. Obviously, a lot of the time when you discussed water charges or any sort of controversial, poli controversial policy issue, the it might be the case that you know, in in the back of every politician, and maybe even in the forefront of politicians' minds, is you know, would, is this an issue we want to go to the country on? Uh, and so perhaps you could argue, well, if you know that you, you're not going to go to the country because this is an absolute fixed term, uh, it might mean that uh, those unpopular decisions are pushed through. But equally, it might mean that there's just a collapse of the government and there's no, there's no relieving election to help kind of break a deadlock. Uh, thanks for those questions, I think they're very useful. Um, if I was to try to define what a fixed-term parliament is, I think it's a situation in which there is no 
power to call at an election at an earlier point other than a prescribed period. Okay, so we currently have a maximum term but not a fixed term because there is a power to shorten the duration uh, of Parliament. In a fixed term, there's not only a maximum, but you can't, no figure has the power to call an election at an earlier point, but possibly with some limited exceptions, and that's probably what was called a semi-fixed term. Okay, uh, Under a fixed term Parliament, what are the consequences of the government uh, losing a vote? Well, if that means um, a vote of confidence, well, the idea of a fixed term is partly, I think, is that it might make it easier to have a change of government without an election because the defeated government won't find it as easy uh, to call a, a, an early election as a, in an attempt to return to power. So in theory, it makes it easier, as in the 1994 scenario, to have a new coalition, a new Taoiseach, without an election, a new government formed from within the, uh, the same doll. Um, that, in theory, should be a good thing. It should be possible for it should be possible for the doll to remove a Taoiseach without that automatically dissolving itself. In other words, to make a decision to remove confidence in government and to form a new government without that automatically triggering a general election. Um, that's how parliaments in in the UK used to work in the uh, in, in 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 the nineteenth century, for example. You'd very frequent. Uh, governments um, rising and falling without necessarily there being an election. Uh, it depends on whether there's more than one possible coalition arrangement within the same doll. That was the case in 1994, but it's not often, it's not, well, Owen will know more, better than I, but it's not necessarily very often the case, okay? Um, if it's a, a loss of vote on something else, will it make it easier to, um, to implement legislation? Um, if, if anything, I think one of the effects on, um, of the current setup where the Taoiseach has the power uh, to, to advise a dissolution or to threaten implicitly or otherwise a dissolution is that it's a way of forcing people's hands. It may be a way of getting certain measures passed. It does give a certain amount of bargaining power, whereas in theory, not necessarily in practice, under a fixed term, uh, under a fixed term parliament, uh, the Doyle could reject controversial legislation, but without necessarily running a high risk of that leading to an early general election. Does that make sense? So it should actually weaken the hand of government in trying to pass uh, controversial legislation. In theory, it should strengthen the hand of parliament vis-a-vis -vis the, uh, the government. But that, as Owen said, that's highly contingent on the, uh, on the political landscape at any given time. What would have happened in the 80s, say the scenario 1981-1982 where you had three elections in the space of a year and a half, well it would depend on how the fixed term legislation would be designed, whether there would be exceptions built in such as that you could have an early election with a two-thirds majority or something like that, but we assume that it would, uh, it would force, um, it would force um, uh, more reflection and more attempts to form alternative governments without necessarily having recourse uh, to an early general election. It might have led to less general, fewer general elections depending on how uh, the legislation was designed. Thanks. Yes, uh, table three. Good morning, Judge and the panel. Um, I'm the facilitator for the citizens of table number three. Uh, they have one question uh, for both members of the panel. Um, what, do they, what does the panel believe would occur uh, if the Taoiseach formally approached the President to dissolve uh, a doll due to a lack of confidence and the President refused? Um, they wanted to know what exactly happens next. The citizens are aware that this is yet to formally occur and you have no precedent to rely on, but they were curious as to know what you feel would happen next. So. What happens next, I suppose, is that the doll is then has to go and try and elect a new Taoiseach, uh, because the Taoiseach, having formally lost the having formally lost the conference of the doll, is asked to resign. He will maintain, and all government ministers will stay in office as caretakers, and which they have no there's no legal restriction on what they can do as caretaker uh, ministers and and a caretaker government. And then the doll probably scrambles around to try and find an alternative uh, government. Uh, and so 
presume a president would only do so if there was a feeling that there was a po at least a possibility of an alternative uh, government to be formed. Now, there's, it's never happened, but it is known that in 1987, the government, ha having lost an election, there was a sense that it, it wasn't clear who won that 1987 election. And it was, there was a fear because there was a fear that there would be an extended period of time without an election. And what we know that what happened there was that the president, Paddy Hillary, approached uh, Gareth Fitzgerald, who had resigned as Taoiseach and was more or less withdrawing from politics, and asked him to become what's called an informateur, uh, somebody who facilitate, to try and facilitate the formation of a new government. As it turned out, that wasn't needed. But we can see that probably presidents will get involved in that formation process, if they, or at least not, not directly, but might try and have some way of facilitating the formation of a new government. That's probably what they would try to do. Owen, uh, yeah. Yes, just to, just to agree with and to recap on what Owen uh, said, if the Taoiseach were refused, he would have to resign immediately, more or less, and, and would continue to govern as a caretaker. Um, now, it's worth mentioning that a president would, in practice, be very unlikely to refuse the request unless there were an alternative coalition available or plausible. That would generally be reasonably clear or known to the president. Even if that weren't the case, what would happen if, say, the, um, you know, the doll failed to appoint a successor? Well, there's nothing to stop the caretaker Taoiseach from going back to the president's after negotiations fail to seek an election then. Now that's never happened, but we assume that a caretaker Taoiseach has the full complement of powers and indeed somebody would have to be able to request uh, the, the president to dissolve the Dáil if it really became necessary. We couldn't continue indefinitely, obviously, without um, uh, a Taoiseach being appointed. Well, technically you can, but it wouldn't be a good thing. Um, so. Um, you know, th th there's, nothing, there's nothing to stop uh, the defeated caretaker Taoiseach from asking the President uh, to reconsider at a later stage. Yeah, and can I just say, just uh, it, that is actually reflected in Article 28, mm, yes. 10 of the Constitution. And just to remind you that that says the Taoiseach shall resign from office upon his ceasing to retain the support of a majority in Dáil Éireann. And then this is the important bit, unless unless on his advice the president dissolves the all and on the, re on the reassembly of the all after dissolution, the Taoiseach secures the support of the majority in the all -Aaron. So that, that, that actually reflects what, 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 what you've just been told by both Owens. Um, oh yeah, well, one more question I'll take, is that table 10? 13. 13. Yeah, yeah, and this will be our last question. I'm the facilitator for table 13, and the citizens at this table would like to know, how can a government stay in power if it has failed to pass a money bill? A money bill. Yeah, yeah. Uh, as a caretaker. Uh, as a caretaker government, effectively, is the answer. Because, um, it, well, it went. well, if the government resigns following a loss, following that loss of confidence, or being defeated on a confidence and supply issue, uh, either the the, an election is called uh, with the consent of the president, uh, or uh, the government continues to hold, the, the members of government continue to exercise their powers until the, their successors have been appointed. And it can also go back and try again. So, for yeah. instance, if it is defeated on a money bill, it can, say, take that budget that it was defeated on, revise it, uh, and ask the doll to approve it again. So it doesn't necessarily mean that it's the, the, the government has to resign. I mean, there are cases where a, a Taoiseach almost had to be kind of forced to, to formally resign it, even though it was, n it was never actually formal. But I think in, the, in this situation, you can just go back and ask the doll again. And so it, it's usually more practical than that, in that you know when, whether you've no chance of governing or not. And if, you feel you've, if your government feels you've no chance of governing, then it will, try and it will try to go to the country and have an election. Very good. Well, then we'll ha I think we deserve our coffee break now, don't we? <laughs> and, but before we go there, um, I just want to say thanks again to both Owens, and they're staying with us. Uh,
we're resuming at 11.30.